and welcome to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast coming to you from Vitality Stadium. We're here to bring you closer to some of the personalities connected to the club throughout the course of the season. Now, for those who haven't tuned in before, my name is Zoe Rundle and I'm part of the media team here at AFC Bournemouth. I think by now you're probably used to Chris Temple's jet setting. It's not the Euros, it's not the Olympics, but it's the Paralympics that he's missing this podcast for. So once again, you've got me here in his place. Now then, it wouldn't be an AFC Bournemouth podcast without Mr Bournemouth himself. As ever, I'm joined by my colleague Neil Perrett here at Vitality Stadium. Neil, it's lovely to see you. We're still unbeaten in the league and we've made some exciting new signings across the transfer window. Been a fantastic transfer window. Seven seven recruits coming in, two of them on loan. I think that if you look back maybe two or three weeks ago, nobody would have predicted how it how it finished for us. I think the squad's looking in, in great shape now. Not that it wasn't before. With a lot of the younger players doing really well. Like you say, still unbeaten in the league. Gloss over the League Cup. Move on. See where it takes us, Zoe. Absolutely, it's going to be a really exciting campaign. Now, talking of exciting, we've got a really exciting guest on our podcast today. It's a man who made 145 appearances for the Cherries across a four-year spell. He captained us to Premier League promotion in one of our most famous seasons, and he's recently taken up a new role at the club. Without further ado, we're delighted to welcome Tommy Elphick onto the AFC Bournemouth podcast. First things first, we want to start with the here and now. Just tell us a little bit more about how that new role came about for you. Yeah, I'm really happy to be back. And as I say, I've, I've been out a long time injured now, so I've had a, a lot of time to think about what was next for me. Um, the injury was and wasn't part of the reason why I stopped playing. Um, when you're out injured for for those um, that amount of period of, of, of time, you, you think about what's coming next, especially at the age I was. Um, and yeah, it was... It was uh, Something that we spoke about for a while, I think ever since I left Bournemouth, I always maintained a relationship um, with certain people at the, at the club who are, who are still here, the likes of Richard Hughes, um, Frano, even up to the managers, Eddie and, and, and Jason, you know, um, to remain in contact. And as I say, when, when you're out injured that long, you sort of continue them conversations and, and they progress a little bit. And yeah one thing leads to another the club would would always ring me if they was looking for a character reference on on someone that they were signing that I might have played with and then you end up talking about what could be next and I don't know when I was out injured those conversations progressed a little bit and yeah just really happy to be back somewhere where I love and 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 hopefully I'm respected and, and my stock's still relatively high and and can get going with the next part of my life and this new role that you're coming into just explain a bit more about what you're going to be doing and I understand working closely with Sean Cooper like again, really, uh, really lucky to be working with the likes of Coops and 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 Al Connell in the academy. Um, two coaches that are highly thought of in, in, at the club. Um, you know, I've had sort of chance to see Coops and 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 Al work this morning, and yeah, the way they do things and 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 the methods they have are, are really good, and I've got plenty to learn learn from them. I'm I'm like a blank canvas, I suppose. It's like going back to school. So um, again, back to the club, the, the fact that they've seen someone that they want to nurture and, and, and help progress in their coaching career, it's, it's something that I won't take lightly and, and, and I'm looking forward to do. So just getting my hands dirty and, and, and getting stuck in with Coops, um, trying to develop these younger lads, especially when they jump up and down from the first team, helping with that, because I know mentally that can be tough, especially when you're dropping back down. So yeah, really looking for just, just coaching really and, and, and seeing where it takes us. Sometimes people can forget that footballers and coaches are actually human beings and have a life. Just tell us about the the logistics for you. Um, I would imagine that you were settled somewhere in the Midlands, um, family-wise moving, and I think there's been a couple of additions to the family as well. Yeah, so so left with uh, left with no kids and coming back with two two girls, one and three. So that's all full on at the moment. So the missus back in in yeah we're in Sally Hall. We're based up there at the moment. So looking to get back and, and set up camp as soon as possible. But as we all know, the market's crazy at the moment. And when there's seven new signings, I think you said Neil, they're all looking for houses. So I'm in a I'm in a big pond. Um, yeah, uh, so they're up there I'll just be back and forth as much as possible staying down as and when as much as much as I can really just trying to be I want to be based as as around these coaches you know there's so many good coaches at the club even like academy below the 18s and and 21s that you can pick so much up from and and being around the first team building still and and hopefully getting to a stage where you're picking the brains of of the likes of the manager and and Matt Wells and Gary O'Neill and Fletch who's been around it a long time now so the quicker we can get the family down and, and get settled and, and set up camp, that that'll be that'll be good as well. Yeah. So, as I say, coming back with two kids is a bit more stressful. 
I think your phone just pinged there. Was that right? Was that right move again? Or um, <laughs> yeah. how difficult is that? But that side of it. Yeah, moving? it's tough. Do you know what? It's, I've always said as a player, it's probably the most underestimated thing. I was actually having a conversation with someone um, midweek. Uh, who plays a part in recruiting lads at, at Brentford and they've brought a French lad over and he's in a hotel, he doesn't really speak the language and, you know, you're trying to get your family over, you're trying to look for houses, then you've got 25 new teammates to meet and you've got seven or eight coaches to listen to and try and take it all in, then you're expected to perform on the Saturday. So these things take a huge amount of time and I think we saw that under Eddie's reign here as well, the way we used to work, it, it used to take time to pick up. I'm sure it was, it's, it's pretty similar with 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 how Scott's trying to do things as well you know you don't just pack a bag and you're down the road and you're playing football you know there's a lot more to that and, and getting these lads and, and coaches I so, suppose settled off the pitch is just important than getting them settled on it. I know it's early days but what's it like to be back here? Yeah brilliant I mean yeah you read, read the messages on, on social media that you've just informed me about and yeah as I say coming back to a play I've had a long time to think about what the best route is for me it's, it's something I want to do and we can all sit indoors on the sofa and say yeah I want to coach and manage but until you actually go and do it you don't actually know um, it's all sort of a pipe dream isn't it and until you know I've not been walking around these training grounds and, and, and these games with my eyes closed I've been trying to take in as much as I can and played for some wonderful managers and coaches um, yeah as I say the, the, the longer I can just sort of watch and, and see how the likes of Coops and, and Alcon will plan backwards from a game plan forwards especially with with Coops you know because he hasn't got many games so to fill them times to, to still keep lad, lads engaged to progress these lads I mean we've seen him do such a great job in there now Connell to prepare these lads for the manager this season um, but yeah it's been good uh, an eye opener um, plenty of hours to be done and, and hard graph and hard yards to do but something I'm really looking forward to obviously the, the training ground was here when you were here uh, Canford is probably going to be a different environment for you so um, has much changed since you were here before? Not really, and it's good to see familiar faces like yourself, Neil. So it's it's nice even when you go into the canteen to see the likes of Marta and Paul the Chef and SA. It's nice to have that fabric and that DNA of the club still here because then people carry it just as much as as the players. And I think Fergie was one of the first, wasn't he, to to engage on that side of things and to know everybody around the club and bring that together. Um, it's always something I thought I did naturally as a player, as as a captain, if you like, as a leader. I was always trying trying to make everyone feel special and feel like they had a, a, a part to play in it. And good people move mountains now. And, and, and yeah, when you've got good people in a building, uh, it can be pretty powerful. You were obviously a young player once. Has much changed, you know, when you go to the academy today? compared to back when you were starting out? Yeah, the club's definitely moved forward. Um, and even bringing me back, you know, the clubs see that there's a long-term future and, and they want to mould and develop people as, as well as players. And that's so, so important. I mean, the owner, since he's come in, the improvements that he made very early on when I was here were quite quick and quite drastic, you know, smartening up the stadium, getting that pavilion built. Pitches were always getting better. The playing side of it was getting better. So... It has moved on, but it still does have that Bournemouth feel that, that we don't want to lose, which makes this this club and this place special. And for you, when you go up to Camford, compared to your early days as a player, what? how do the facilities compare? Has, has technology moved on a lot? Yeah, I mean, it's such a wonderful space and a setting, and yeah, I wouldn't be able to tell you how many pitches are up there. So for these kids to have... That facility, I, I remember going up there once to play a reserve game when I was coming back from an injury in the Premier League, first Premier League season, um, and it has definitely moved on from there. But it's important as well, you know, we want to aspire to be better and keep moving these things forward and making the most of what we have. Um, and there's definitely an intent from the club to do that. So all the while I'm doing what I'm doing, it will be giving everything to try and improve it and, and, and help it and aid it towards what Coops and, and Al Connor were doing. When you think back to your playing days, tell us about some of the, the coaches that you worked under and I'm sure there's a few that stand out. Re re really for fortunate, obviously, you have to start with the manager. Um, yeah, listen, uh, as I said before, I've been to plenty of training grounds now and play for plenty of clubs to know what good and bad looks and, and feels and smells like. And yeah, he, he, he was certainly up there with the best I've ever had. Um, and under that, you know, because he was so good, sometimes you forgot how good JT was. Uh, I was actually talking to, to Coops about it this morning. He was very underrated in the role that he had and in the sessions that he used to take. And on top of that, it's great to see Fletch still at the club and, and still having an input day to day. Um, Tinners and, and Perchy as well. Perchy was such a highly regarded coach with the with the first team lads. So Mossy, yeah, just just really lucky to. And and at the end of the day, for me going forward now, that is my schooling, my grounding as a coach, if you like, because life 
my career changed when I was 22, 23 and on the back of the first serious injury, um, I ruptured my Achilles twice. And at that age, I had to think about oh, what if, because I wasn't guaranteed to get back and, and to play at the level that I wanted to play at. So I made a conscious effort from that time going forward that I'd sit in a dressing room and I'd have an opinion and I'd have a thought in my head about what I thought was good and bad and try and take in and learn as much as I could from from all the coaches I come across so I suppose that has been the definitely the biggest influence on, on my playing career and that's something the lessons that I learned under the likes of Eddie and, and his team will be I suppose what is my starting block my platform if you like as a coach going forward. And coaching now it, it seems a lot more scientific than perhaps it was 10-20 years ago for you you know when you think about that is it almost a case of is there an element even of, of trying not to overload the players and trying not to give them too much information at, at such a young age? Definitely, and I think speaking to Coops this morning, you know, he's got a great balance of giving these players a structure and a way of working, but also giving them the freedom to express themselves because you can go one way or the other. I mean, I'm not afraid to sit here and, and, and say that footballers are... Uh, under average intelligence so you do sometimes need to walk them through and show them absolutely everything I'm a firm believer in that but then you don't want to strangle them so much that they haven't got the freedom to show what they're about and bring that personality through I mean that's the one thing that sticks with me from my time at Bournemouth um, you know you'd have friends or family coming to watch you and so many times you'd come away for a game and say I'd have paid to watch that today and we can't forget that this is an entertainment and people love coming and seeing flair and skill and character and passion and, 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 and that side of the game so yeah we want to give these lads a way of working but not strangle them and, and give them the confidence to express themselves We're sitting here overlooking Kings Park Tommy and 30 years ago the team would be training outside the cafe there and there's a lot of dog walkers there and someone would normally have to go around and clean up before the training session started going back to your very early days what were your first facilities like when you were when you were starting out actually trained on Kings Park now as well so yeah weren't, weren't that long ago but yeah um at Brighton we was uh, university yeah sharing sharing change rooms with the public um quickly moved that on and um, we was very fortunate to have uh, the Bloom family come into the club and, and, and back the club financially made that a private part to the training ground uh, pitches were always getting invested in um, yeah they improved the gym and, and the analysis side we got an analysis room uh, portal cabins albeit but it was for us you know and it was the first sense of um almost belonging and this is ours and let's look after it and, and create an atmosphere and a culture at, at, at that place um obviously come to to Bournemouth after then and and yeah we was getting changed at the stadium driving out to Camford where sort of the academy are now sometimes Camford school training there back in the cars back to the, the home dressing rooms or the away dressing rooms at the time shower eat upstairs in this room that we're in now um then obviously the Premier League season was was what changed that you know the the owner invested massively into the pavilion and yeah great facility pitches were always improving every year and then really lucky to to, to go and play for Aston Villa because it was state of the art and it was a whole new level for me and, and something I hadn't seen before so um I've experienced a lot of different environments and, and training grounds and something where when when you go back up to Camford now it's you know these lads are really lucky to have that facility because it's not a bad facility and I remember when I was starting out I never had anything like that um, but the inspiration is to end up at the Pavilion or at an Aston Villa training ground. So, um, yeah, as I say, I've, again, that's something that I don't take for granted. And, you know, for these lads, you have to work hard towards getting something like that. So it's poacher turned gamekeeper now for you. You've been a player and now you're starting out in coaching. When you cast your mind back to being a player, what did you like and dislike about anything coaching related? Did you sort of turn up one morning and you saw that cones were set out somewhere and it was like, oh no, we're not doing that again or anything like that? Loved, loved coming in and seeing something set up because it means the coaches have thought, thought about it and, and there's, there's a reason behind something that we're doing. Hated time wasting. Um, couldn't stand it if a manager was bringing me back to play head tennis in the afternoon. You know, wasting my time. Like, don't do that to me. Let's, let's, if you're going to bring me back, let's, let's do something that's going to educate me and, and, and make me a better player. So I was always one that was, as I say, the injury changed me a lot because up until that stage when you're a young lad, um, I suppose you're a little bit happy-go-lucky. You, you do whatever's in front of you. But then, when 
I was out about 18 months. I had a lot of time to think about the game and think about what my future was. And at that point, I decided my life in football was always going to be 30 or 40 years, never a playing career and, and move on. Um, so, yeah, I used to take uh, a lot away from sessions, used to think about, well, where is the manager's thoughts come from? What was the inspiration behind that training session? What are we gearing up to do? Um, not just doing a session for the sake of doing a session at a time filler. I couldn't stand coming in and just doing, back in the day, it was a circle and a, and a fire side. <laughs> Again, waste of time. Like, yeah, we'll get a sweat on. And back then it was, though, it was just as much for the manager. I remember having managers and, and coaches, old school managers and coaches, if you like. It was just as much for them than it was the players on a Monday, come in, put a load of layers on sweat the alcohol out from from the weekend you know what I mean waste of time I haven't improved as a player but I suppose my youth team coach was 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 he was a bit of an innovator he was he was a very deep thinker um and did get us thinking from 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 a young age and yeah and installed lessons into me that that stood me in good stead for 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 my career going forward so as I said I've been really really lucky to to have some some really good ones, but the one thing I will say, you don't appreciate the good ones until you, until you have a bad one. You learn probably more under the bad ones than you do the good ones. Just changing subject completely, what did you make of the transfer window business the club did? It was almost the year we got relegated because of COVID. It was quite settled in some ways. Probably wasn't as much business as needed to be done, or that was anticipated in being done um so it was quite settled but I think this was almost the season where that was going to happen there was a little bit more money flying about maybe um players were probably getting a little bit wanting to get back to a certain level wanting to secure futures so I think this season was always going to have a, a turnover of players as well with a change of manager so I think the club have done great business um and and yeah looking forward to seeing how that progresses Sean Cooper and Alan Connell, two guys who played a huge role in this club's journey from the lower reaches of League Two. Sean was the captain of the greatest escape season. Alan Connell scored some vital goals. Like you, you also a uh, big, tremendous servant to the club, played a huge role captaining the, the two promotions. Tell us, how do you see the dynamic working with those two guys? I'm, I'm just here to learn. Um, it was very important for me that I got off on the right foot with these lads because I didn't actually share a dressing room with them. I don't actually have a connection with them um, apart from playing for Bournemouth. So it was very important um, that they was made aware that I was coming in and what I was coming in to do. And again, Richard Hughes and, and, and Simon Francis played a massive part in that in um, sort of laying out what the outlook is for me and for them. And yeah, listen, I'm just here to absolutely support them in any way, shape or form. When I'm asked to give an opinion, give an opinion. Um, There'll be a time, I suppose, when I progress as a coach. I'm nowhere near ready to go out and take 25 lads, like because I just haven't done enough coaching to to, to be in that position. Um, so yeah, just as I say, it's back to school. This is the start of my apprenticeship. This is the start of my schooling again. Um, there's little things, stupid things, Neil, like how you set bibs up, how you set cones up that you just take for granted as a player. You know, you you, you rock out of bed at 8:30. You're in the training ground for 9:30. You have got your breakfast served to you, and your sessions in front of you, but when you're not that player, you have to think and, and, and live differently. Um, and even since I knew that I was starting, you know, you just start watching and, and on YouTube, having a look at how different managers do things. And yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of them. I think I've got a lot of um, characteristics to, to hopefully be successful going forward, things that will stand me in good stead, my personality, um, uh, stuff like that. So yeah, it's now about the process of, I, I, I think I know, and, and I've been lucky enough to, to have success in uh, uh, relative to, to the standard I was playing. I, I, I think I know and, and can feel what success needs to look like and, and, and feel like, um, but that's all a good idea. You need to know the process and how to get there and, and, and how to mold and develop these lads and get them on board and motivate them. So yes, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And obviously I dealt with Sean Cooper when he was a player and um, I, sh I shared a coach back with him recently when he was taking the under 21s and you know it's like half past midnight and he's sitting in the front seat with his coaching manual you know flicking through it and our incredible dedication to the job and I, I suppose he wouldn't mind me saying I probably didn't see that when he was a player and it's sort of almost similar with Warren Cummings as well if you'd have said to me is Warren Cummings going to be a successful coach when he was a player I would have thought maybe but I, I think he might be an agent or something like that but these guys have really, really taken to it and you're obviously going to be hoping to follow them. 
it's one of them like when you actually look at the the managers that these lads had it might not be a surprise you know when you when you've worked under managers like Eddie like Sean O'Driscoll they leave a mark on you um, they've certainly left a mark on me managers like Eddie uh, Gus Poyer coaches like Dean Wilkins uh, Dean Smith at Villa um, as I say I've, I've, I've seen some good and some bad ones um, even, even a guy I was chatting to Coops about this morning was a guy called Steve Harrison uh, quite a famous coach used to work for Graham Taylor as, as um, assistant manager for England and he used to come in at Villa twice a week and I was just fascinated by the process of what he went through to clip a game up to watch a back four, to see what he saw. And it's all good and well seeing it. We can all see it. We've all played the game. We all have an understanding of the game. You all know what, yeah, that's right, that's wrong. But it's then right, how can I get that over in a training session or in a in a one-on-one -on -one session? Or how can I get a lad on on board and tuned into what I'm seeing? Um, so that's something I'm looking forward to, to developing and, and, and going to war with. Well, we're going to take a little bit look little bit of a look back at your career now we're going to go back right to the start so how's your memory not very good <laughs> <laughs> well we're going to start all the way back at Brighton um how did you end up finding your way to Brighton as a youngster just give us a little bit of an insight on that yeah I mean Brighton's one of them places obviously it's it's the only club in the city uh it's the only club within 40 or 50 miles so anyone who's got half a chance usually ends up at, at some sort of Brighton Academy um, you used to go through the processes uh, school football uh, you go and play for Brighton schools and, and that's where Brighton and Hove Albion used to pick up a lot of their players from um, so yeah I think I signed when I was about 10 or 11 um, went through my youth team days was, was alright I suppose <laughs> um, had a great youth team um, we, we actually, I think about 13 of us ended up getting scholarships. Uh, I think we got to the last, was it the semi-finals or the quarter-finals of the Youth Cup? Got knocked out by a good Newcastle side. I think we're still the most successful youth team that, that Brighton's had. Uh, set all sort of records and, 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 and uh, yeah, that probably still stand. Uh, seven or eight of us went on to be pros. Uh, my brother was a couple of years older than me. He joined the academy a little bit later at me that sort of 15 16 but ended up a scholar before me um so it was, it was great for me to be able to follow my brother through and I had someone looking out for me and looking after me um but yeah great great times um you sort of talk about facilities and infrastructure now but the one thing that always stuck with me was the group of players that we had to look up to and they just maximized everything they had um, and when they saw a youngster coming through, worked hard, they used to take them under their wing and, and really nurture them and, and try and give back to them, and which is something that I tried to do in, in, in my my career. Um, and yeah, it was just, just fantastic days. Seven or eight of the lads in my age group went on to make debuts. And I think I was, I'm sort of the only one still, well, just come out of the game, but I was the only one who sort of went on and, and I suppose made a career out of it. Me and Joel Lynch, he, he, had, he had quite a good career, played for some big clubs. Um, but yeah, times I, I wouldn't change. I look at the youngsters now, they have so many different outside influences and it's tougher for these boys. Um, and like me being in the role I'm in now, you need to adapt and and know what they're going through as well. And it's it's not straightforward anymore for me. It was hard work, give yourself a chance. And, and if you're good enough, you'll, you'll sort of, you'll get there. But as I say, so many different influences now to be aware of and, and, and try and keep these lads on the straight and narrow and, and, and getting the most out of themselves. You say you had a, a good youth team, a strong youth team. Do you ever keep in touch with any of those lads now? Uh, a couple, like sort of on, when things like this happen, retirement and that, you get the odd text and yeah, you stay in touch uh, along the way. But football's such a crazy game. You spend all this time with these lads and yeah, you sort of lose touch very quickly because you're all in your own little bubble and, and trying to maximise, I suppose, what you're doing and you just don't have the time. Um, so yeah, it was great days. Uh, we had a we had a great team, such competitive a edge from a from a from an early age, and because I probably wasn't the best in that age group, I had to find a way to win and stay on the horse and 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 yeah, stay in the team, I suppose. And yeah, the the older pros they sort of took a shine to that and and tried to take me under their wing and 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 yeah, taught me some great lessons. You mentioned earlier your brother Gary. I believe you made your debut uh, while Gary was in the team. It was a five-one defeat away to Reading and Gary got sent off in that game am I right in thinking that must have made an interesting family, uh, yeah, family meal it, afterwards it's a str strange one because we had me and my brother are so close um, and we was actually striking up a great relationship on the pitch in the reserves at the time 
uh, we played a reserve game together on the Thursday night in I think it was the Sussex Senior Cup at a, a non-league team and it was like an absolute bog mid- middle of winter uh, went to extra time and penalties and we both played it all and this was on the Thursday and then on the Saturday he was asked to play in a back three on the right side away at Reading who went on to get 100 points that season and score over 100 goals and like if you're ever set up for failure that, that was the afternoon so I felt absolutely like horrific for him but yeah, he, he he ended up getting two yellows and sent off, and and I come on, and I think I got the assist for the one. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, bit bit a sweet day for the family. But yeah, listen to to say that we played together, he he should have actually made a living out of the game. And if if he had got the ru- rubber to green and and things had fell for him in a different way, I'm sure he would have done. But yeah, he's he's had a a, a strong career at, at non-league level, and yeah, it's it's um it was a weird day for the family, that's for sure. Your your memory's not that bad if you can remember the assist. Yeah, Leon Knight scored, did he, Neil? Yeah, come on and yeah, stepped in and played him a ball. Yeah, it weren't really an assist. It ricocheted off about three different people and he ended up scoring. But yeah, strange day. Now, all those years ago, Brighton was nowhere near as stable as it is now. It's a little bit like here. You know, 15 years ago, this club was nowhere near as stable as it is now. I know Tony Bloom's been responsible for most of that. What was that like for a young player there when it were things that wasn't really the stability there? Brilliant because there was hope of breaking into that first team. There was a pathway. Um, you knew that the club was relying on getting two or three youngsters for a year to to put a team out and to fill the bench. So um, not only did we have a great first team to look up to in terms of maximum they weren't the best but they just got every sort of inch out of themselves you know they stretched the ability that they, they had tenfold and lads like Richard Carpenter Guy Butters Danny Cullip uh, Charlie Oatway um, you know they were the bedrock of that team at that time and to see how they acted and 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 carry themselves around the training ground was just the greatest lesson but as a youngster you always knew that you had a sniff of getting to that first team. Um, so yeah, w- wouldn't change it for the world. Sometimes these academies now, like when I went on, especially to, to play for Villa, the club is so big. You have a, a first team of 23s, a 21s, a 19s, an 18s, a 17s. A, you know, there's just so many players at these football clubs and you can be probably 20 players away from getting to that first team. But when you was coming through at Brighton, you knew that there was a centre half, two centre halves, a backup, I knew could be next so there was always that hope of it could be me like I need to be getting better and better and giving myself a chance and it was a selling club so you knew that if you did get through and you played 50 games in the space of a year you'd be moving on to bigger and better things so great club to get my school in um, some brilliant coaches the likes of, of Dean Wilkins who I said before Martin Inchwood Vic, Vic Bragg and just give me a great grounding You've always spoken very fondly of Gus Poyer as well just what was it about him? Yeah, just opened my eyes to football, really. I, Dean Wilkins was our youth team manager and uh, I think there's about seven or eight of us that went on to become pros and he actually ended up in charge and he'd done a great job. We just missed out on the playoffs in his first year and I was flying and they sacked him randomly. Um, and then they sort of went, they went not backwards, but they went to Mickey Adams and they went Russell Slade and it was back to the old school a little bit, get as fit as we can, get the best players on the pitch and let's see where it takes us. Whereas Dean was a coach and I've always, I've always thrived on being coached and being educated, whether, and that doesn't matter what style it is, whether we're playing long and turning teams and getting them in the corner, but let's coach it and do it properly and know what our triggers and our, you know, patterns are or whether it's splitting out from the back and, and playing through the thirds, you know, it was always, right, let's, let's educate me. I'm open, I want to be educated, I want to learn. Um, and I used to love that. And I was sort of missing that for a couple of years. Um, and then Gus come into the football club and just opened my eyes to football again. Um, just give me a philosophy that I've never seen done at that level, like considering we was bottom of the league in League One. Um, he took us in that season to the cusp of the playoffs and, and then we won the league, absolutely romped home in the league the next season. Um, and just the ideas that he'd give us, he used to work loads on numbers, he used to cut pitches in halves and quarters and if you've got five there, where's the other? You, you know, it was just crazy the way he used to think and it's like, wow, yeah, this is me, like this is football. Um, and yeah, just loved every minute playing under him. One of the instabilities at Brighton was obviously the the ground and they've got a magnificent stadium now. I remember a 1-1 draw against the Cherries with Dean in October 2010. Now, 
I think if I remember, you were given the runaround by Steve Fletcher <laughs> and you conceded a late penalty for a clear handball, <laughs> which was miles in the box. Do you <laughs> still have nightmares about that? Yeah, game? Oh, well, it's funny. I was, I was asked about it the other day, but Gus Poirier was one of these managers. It was black or white. Like he was just straight down the line. And we had signed Gordon Greer in the summer, paid a bit of money for him. We've, the Blooms had just taken over and we was having a go at getting promoted. And Gordon Greer was signed to be captain. Um, and I remember Gus pulling me and saying, he's coming in to play with you, but he's suspended for the first three games. So it was me and another lad who had come through the youth team. And I think we went about 10 games unbeaten and Gigi just couldn't get in the team. But before the season started, the, the Friday before the season started, Gus sat me and the other lad was called Adam. He sat us both down in the office. He said, uh, just so you know, I've paid a lot of money for Gigi. He's coming in, club captain. He's coming to play. He's suspended for the first three games. Whichever one of you makes the first mistake you're coming out the team it's black and white don't matter if it's you Tommy or you Adam first mistake because I've got to get Gigi in so, alright you know what you're dealing with then and we was flying we went 10 games or 11 games unbeaten and then of course we play uh, Bournemouth I think it was an early kickoff. I give a penalty away 1-1 not really a mistake get to the Friday the next, t next week and I'm out the team <laughs> it's one of the things I loved about Gus it was like it was so upfront and honest you, well, you can't go and see him but it weren't even a mistake so it it holds more memories for me at that, for that reason than it does yeah that it was Bournemouth and, and given the penalty away against Big Fletch does Fletch remind you about yeah. the time yeah, yeah. Talk, talking of GG's yeah I know that you're a, a horse lover yeah. just are you still involved with that it's, it's still involved um, for all my sins Neil it's like I always think it's important to have a release whether you're a manager a coach a, a player you need a release from this game because it's so intense and one thing I do is I immerse myself in, in something, whether it's a playing project, a coaching project. Now that's that's just me. I have to live and, and breathe and, and eat it and, and take it to bed with me. But you have to get away from it. And yeah, that's something that goes back years through my dad and, and something I've enjoyed. And yeah, quite recently made a good friend who, who, who's training called Ollie Murphy. Um, so that's where my days are spent on a day off is, is on the gallops, trying to clear a bit of, bit of my mind. Just going back to the football, you speak just then so fondly of your time at Brighton was it a wrench to leave there? Uh, yeah, it was in the way it sort of happened because uh, when I was coming through, I had a very good first season and, and I was close to leaving. I remember sitting, speaking to Mick McCarthy a couple of times. I was, I was close to going to Wolves. Um, I was close to Derby at one stage, um, but I decided to stay. The owner at the time was, was Dick Knight and they'd just got permission for the new stadium and, and, and I was the first player to sign a contract into the new stadium and the dream was a local lad leading the team out at this new stadium that we've been waiting for so long. Um, as I say, Gus just opened my eyes to football again and I was loving it so much. But on the final day of... Uh, we won League One on the final day, I actually ruptured my Achilles. Um, so I missed out on playing at the Amex as such um, and had that year out so there was an emotional attachment in terms of yeah I'd love to to get back and play at this fantastic new stadium but I knew for my career I needed to get out and, and re-establish myself because I'd been out quite a, quite a time um, and the rest is history as they say isn't it? Absolutely and you come to Bournemouth how did that move come about when did you first hear about the interest in and why did you decide to come to Bournemouth? So I went back to pre-season. I had, had a setback with my Achilles, had to have another operation. I'd missed a whole year. I think it was about 14 months from, from game to game. Um, went back that pre-season. Things move on. Um, we had a young centre-half coming through, Lewis Dunk, who's obviously gone on and done some unbelievable stuff at, at Brighton, captain there now. Uh, we had Gigi, myself and, and Adam Alab. So I was one of four going into that pre-season. I knew I'd have to bide my time and train well to, to get sort of back in the mix and I come back I had a good pre-season and I remember sitting down with Gus and at that time you could go out on loan for quite a short period and he said to me I think it's a good idea just go out on loan for three months get some games get 10 games come back and we'll have a bash at it sort of try and get back in the team again I was in the final year of my contract and one of the teams that wanted to take me I had about seven or eight teams that wanted to take me on loan in, in League One um, Pompey I remember Bournemouth, Coventry, uh, MK Dons, there was a few. Um, and Bournemouth were the ones that were coming on quite strong. I remember driving down to meet the um, meet the manager at the time, Paul Groves, and just, yeah, it just felt right. Um, I had a good conversation with him about how he was trying to do something. There was a bit of a transition period at the club. Um, I wasn't quite aware of, I suppose, 
the unease in the stands at the time. Um, they'd got rid of Lee Bradbury, I think it was, and Paul and Sean Brooks, as it was, were the youth team coaches who sort of got pushed up. And yeah, it was all a bit sort of, but I wasn't really aware of that. Um, and Paul presented to me really well. And I drove away and I thought, yeah, this is going to be a right fit for me, not too far from home. A uh, nice family feel about the club. As Neil said previously, it sort of reminded me a little bit of Brighton and, you know, there was a bit of money coming in with, with Max coming to the club and a bit of investment and they were looking to progress things and move things forward. And I just thought, yeah, this is this is the right place for me. And I remember driving away from, from meeting Paul and I got to Roundham Services. You know, I got through the forest, got to Roundham's and my agent rung me, he said, how did it go, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, all we said, oh, just, just to let you know, they want to sign you permanently. So I said, all right, uh, Brighton have got a price. Brighton are big on stats and the stats equal a price. So they got a price from, from Brighton. Bournemouth were happy to pay it. And I thought, yeah, let's, let's go for it. I could secure my future for, for three years off the back of a serious injury. That was a big thing for me. Um, take my time getting back from the injury and, and, and see where it took us. Um, I remember driving back on my way home. I had to go past the stadium and, and Gus was at the stadium. He rang me to see how it went and uh, popped into the stadium to see Gus. He was doing a, a fans uh, sort of evening with them. Uh, we spoke about things. I said, Do you know what? I think it's the right thing for me. Um, he agreed to, to sort of not stand in my way. And, and, and yeah, that was how it came about, really. Was there any sort of doubts in your mind at all? Because obviously you go there thinking, I'm going to go on loan, I'm going to play 10 games, and then I'm going to come back and try and fight for my place in this team. And then all of a sudden, on the way back, you stop at the services, you pick up a phone call and suddenly you could be going permanently. Um, no, I'm, I'm quite impulsive like that. When something feels right and when it's time to move on, um, yeah, I don't want to outstay my welcome. And it felt right. I'd sort of, when you're the, the young local lad coming through a team, some, sometimes you can always be looked, like, looked upon like that. Um, my dad was always pushing me to to be in the school of thought. You need to get out. Brighton's a funny place, you know. It's, it's Everyone knows everyone's business and and uh, it's quite, um, yeah, it's, it's quite on top of you. And he always thought the making of me would be getting out of the city and, and becoming a man, as he said. <laughs> um, although I wasn't moving very far, it was the making of me. Um, as I said, I had such a great time there. I got promoted with my hometown club and yeah, the club, a lot had gone on since I'd been out injured. We'd moved to this new stadium. We was moving into a new training ground. And I ju it just felt right. When you came to Bournemouth, you scored two goals in your first three games. We thought we'd sign the new Sergio Ramos. I know. <laughs> what were your know, memories sorry. of that? Let down. Um, <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't an easy time to come into the club. I remember playing my first game. I think, oh, there's a little. There's not many here. You know, it's quite uneasy in the stands. Like, what? What is going on? And it's not until you start digging in with your with your new teammates. Like, what's what's the story? Like, well, how's all this come about? And it was oh, I've made a bad decision here. And I'm, I'm not scared to say it. Like it was at the time, I'm, I was worried. Um, I think we went 11 or 12 without winning. Uh, plenty of draws. Um, yeah, we was just lost for direction, really. I had such a talented squad. I remember sort of, I took an interest in Bournemouth when Cookie come here on loan. Um, and Charlie Daniels, funnily enough, because he had the same agent as me. And my agent said to me, Bournemouth are... Uh, are trying to have a go at it, just keep an eye on things because I've got a good relationship, might be something down the line for us. So you sort of take an interest in it. Um, yeah, and you could see that was bringing in the likes of Frano, Cookie, Harry Arter, Charlie Daniels, um, had good players already at the club. And yeah, it was sort of when I got in, I'm, I'm looking around, I think we're not, we're not doing what we should be doing here. Like, what is going on? And just didn't feel right. Do you know what I mean? It just didn't have that connection it didn't know everything was fragmented there was lads like who were they were looking to move on there was lads who had just signed and there was no sort of glue to bring it all together um and i'll come on to what actually ended up bringing us together um but yeah we were just lacking a bit of sense of direction and too much talent for where we where we was at that time really i think a polite way of describing it is that the club was in a transitional yeah. period under Paul Groves, a man you've spoken fondly about how he sold the club to you. Clearly a, an excellent coach. Yeah. Harry Redknapp took him everywhere he went. He clearly got all the coaching credentials, but the results just weren't there. It just wasn't there, Neil. Um, yeah, and listen, I don't, I don't know what sort of external factors was going on, but like, you go back, Eddie Mitchell was the one who essentially paid for me and signed me, so I'll, I'll always be forever grateful for him. Um, but yeah, I remember... Been in the dressing room one half time, and 
the owners walking in, oh, this this isn't quite right. Do you know what I mean? This is not this is not what success looks like. Um, so as much of, as Paul and Sean were great coaches, yeah, it just didn't. Yeah, you know what it feels like. It just it just wasn't right. Something wasn't quite right underneath it all. And I remember we used to be like sort of we used to train at Camford. We used to get change here, train at Camford, come back, shower, and we'd be sitting around till three or four o'clock, sort of not really doing anything but just being around. Um, I don't know whether it was to try and create that sort of togetherness to try and yeah show that we was working hard. But like I said before, I get annoyed when my time is being wasted wasted if we're going to be back at three or four let's let's go to work like let's go out on a training pitch or let's get in a video room let's try and educate ourselves where this is all going wrong and I remember going to Sheffield United I think we lost 5-2 I think I scored and the bus broke down in the car park um and I think I think Paul saw a sort of opportunity to address the group on the coach about come on lads like what is this all about I had only been at the club sort of two minutes you know I mean I didn't know the next man sitting sitting next to me to the one in front of me or behind me I, I didn't have that relationship with the lads yet and I just give my opinion on things and I just said look we got to start looking after each other I'm, I'm not bothered what's going on on the pitch or on the training round but as a group we have to come together we've got to drop these egos like we've all come here for a reason because we've had setbacks in our careers if we want to get back to where we should be and where we all think we should be we need to come together and give ourselves a chance of doing that um, yeah whether that stuck with, with some of the lads I, I'll, I'll never know Soon after that Sheffield United game, I hate to remind you, you went to Swindon and I was at the Echo giving marks out of 10 in that game. And I think the, the star man got three out of 10 just for putting his boots mm. on the right Was that foot. me now? <laughs> <laughs> but one player who you will remember from that day on the opposition team became a, a, um, a teammate eventually and a, and a star of the promotion. What, what were your memories of that Swindon game? That Swindon game, I remember going there and they had Matt Ritchie on one wing. Um, I think they had the little lad, was it Ferry maybe on the other wing? Um, and they was just brilliant. Two attacking fullbacks. They was probably the best team in the division and we played with a diamond. <laughs> so, yeah, one way to play in the opposition's hands. Um, yeah, so it was a real, real tough afternoon. I just remember looking around in the dressing room thinking, I think this could be the end here. Um, something's got to change. Um, dress room had gone you started having people in corners which is never good too many people having an opinion um, and it was tough real tough what did you think when Eddie Howe walked through the door in October 2012 yeah I mean at least I was going to talk about the glue that brought it all together but them foundations were, were being set in the background we was giving ourselves I thought we was giving ourselves that chance and, and someone who I thought was massive in that is, is Richard Hughes who's now obviously doing the job he's doing at the club but um we had a little coffee club to go in, FIFA nights. Um, some of us used to like a game of cards. Them little things were just starting to break the barriers down in, in the dressing room and bring us all together. Um, and then obviously the club decided to, 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 to go in a different direction. And as soon as I remember, Cole Robinson was favourite for a while. Um, and again, because we were spending a bit of money on the playing side of, of things, it was really a, a, a really attractive job because we couldn't get no worse. We was only going one way. Um, but then there was whispers of, of obviously Eddie returning and Hughesy was the man in the dressing room who, who knew the manager so well and we was like, is it going to happen, Rich? Oh, what's he like? And Perch, was still around, who had worked under him, Josh McCoy, um, so sort of picking these lads' brains about what could it look like? What's he, is he good? Is it work? Like, and yeah, the minute he walked in, um, breath of fresh air, yeah, again, like I talk about Gus opening my eyes to football, but, but this man took it to a new level. Can you give us any anecdotes of Eddie's early days here? Things that we might not know, if you like. Just, just remember his first day, really. Um, come in, give a really good presentation about the structure of how he likes to work and what a week will look like and what he expects from, from us as, as, as people. Um, not really getting going as the players yet. We, we had plenty of that to get onto, but we went for a walk down to... Um, down to the beach, which Eddie was used to like doing. Uh, he just... With, with JT and... and and I think Chris Hargreaves was still at the club as a coach then as well. And we just sort of got chatting and, and he knew quite a bit about all of us already. Come back to the, to the training ground um, at a light session and that home going, going home. And, and we all got a text that evening about could we all bring £20 in the next day. So we all, put, all bought £20. I think, what's this all about? And say there was 20 of us, we all put £20 into a pot that morning. Uh, he drew up four teams and it was a tournament and the winners were going to get the money. Uh, Kevin Bond actually was brought in to, to judge the player of the tournament as well. So there was different prizes, but he taught us how to win. Um, nothing groundbreaking yet, just taught us 
this is how you win a game of football. This is what it means. This is what it needs to look like going forward. This competitive edge. This is what we. This is our spirit now. And it was from that day on. You can start getting stuck into to someone, and you find a motivation. You find a common goal. Um, yeah, and then week by week we were layering it. It was getting better and better. And one week it might not go right. It'd bring it back a couple of weeks. We'd layer it again. And yeah, before you know it, we're top of the league. Eddie came in. He soon appointed you as the captain he was always very particular about his captain so you must have been absolutely made up when you know he had that conversation with you yeah made up but it's one of them for me <laughs> at the end of the day it's an armband do you know what I mean I always carried responsibility and I always sort of led when I was at school so I wasn't going to put an armband on and change or anything stupid like that or I, you know, of course I take massive pride and it was a massive honour to captain the club and do what we done but I didn't want to all of a sudden change overnight and start shouting at people to do things and finding people that right. It's, it's cobblers. Um, I believe you made captain for a reason, so don't change. Just carry on what you're doing. And it was just nice to be tight with Eddie on on that level from from day one, really. And and yeah, be looked at, I suppose, as as his man in the dressing room. And when you've got such a a good leader in the manager whose directions and instructions are so clear, it's just so easy to follow. And for you, from the depths of League, League One to promotion all in the same season, it must have been such an incredible feeling for you and, and the rest of the lads. Just tell us about those two games at the end of the season, Carlisle yeah, and Tranmere. So many memories from that season, even the Christmas night out that season. Like As stupid as it sounds, I could talk about Husey bringing the dressing room together with different things, cards. We all, we all like to have a bet on the cards, you know what I mean? On a Friday, it would just bring us together. We'd be up sort of till nine o'clock playing cards. It's, you know, Eddie would probably freak if he'd have heard, but it was bringing us all together. Um, and I remember the Christmas night out, I always remember we went to a club up in London called Rose Club and just having such a great time with lads that, you know, we was breaking them barriers down. We was actually becoming friends and becoming close. Um, and it had a bit more feeling towards it. And we was all of similar ages. As I said before, we all had setbacks, whether it was injuries or a club rejected us. And we all needed it. That was the bottom line. We all needed to get to a level where we could make a living out of the game. Um, and that, that I always remember that Christmas night out is probably the biggest thing for us that season in creating a team spirit and a bond. Um, and for me, yeah, it, it did mean a, a, a deal more because I took, not a risk, but I dropped down a level and I wanted to get back to that level. Um, and coming back like 18 months earlier, I was down and out and done. Like it, I was touch and go whether I'd play another game, let alone go and get some sort of relative success. So I think from that day on, yeah, you just I was one to never take it for granted. And that bond that you talk about off the pitch, did it bring you so much closer on the pitch? Did you, you almost wanted to win for each other, I suppose. Yeah, 100%. And I was, we was chatting before, but good people move mountains. Like, I'm a massive, massive believer in good people and lads that give themselves a chance, you know. And, uh, yeah, the bond we had, it's, it's, it's something that y you just can't walk into a football club and create. It takes time, it takes energy, um, it takes an openness. Um, but once you've got that, it's so, so powerful when you're digging in with five or 10 minutes to go and you're one nil up away from home and you've got someone next to you who cares for you and, and wants to see you do, do as well as they want to do and you're all living your lives right, you're buying into it, you know, you're on board with the manager. And I suppose it's something I've craved since I've left and, and never quite got, which is disappointing in some ways because that's what you start to think normal is um, and you think it's easy to get, but that can't be underestimated now a dressing room can be so powerful. You obviously had a great bond with the lads inside the dressing room, but away from the dressing room, you won Supporters Player of the Year that season and you always had a good rapport with the supporters and that's even been seen, you know, recently with your announcement to come back. I think supporters buy into honesty, don't they? And, and yeah, people who want to work hard and, and, and give their all. Listen, we're all extremely privileged to, to be playing football or making a living out of football. So the least you can do is give everything possible for that. And as I said before, I'm someone who immerses myself into something. And I always used to play on my emotions. I thought it was a powerful thing, um, sometimes too powerful. Sometimes it could get the better of you. But I'd rather be that way than someone who's a bit calculated and, you know, trying to play up to the game. So it was it was it was always genuine. Uh, it was a love They 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 did rescue me, this club did rescue me from a really bad injury when, and took a punt on me when some others didn't want to, they only wanted to take me on loan. So I'll, I'll always be grateful for that. And yeah, struck up a great bond, how can you not, when we had four years like we had. So as I say, to come back now and, and to, to revisit all that is, is quite special. Back in the championship, 
a league that was littered with teams who'd been in the Premier League and you know not fallen on hard times but struggling everybody wants to get back there Bournemouth were perhaps written off as as they always were but 10th in that season flirted with the playoffs as well what were your memories of that I suppose my standout memory was QPR at home um going up against Harry's team that was littered with stars I remember getting pumped early on in the season by some good teams Watford going up to Huddersfield getting done I think five um, but that, that game against QPI it just felt like we was getting going at the level it felt like we was comfortable at the level again um, and teams were actually starting to worry about us um, and yeah after that game I always thought we had set ourselves up so well um, for, for, for the next season Eddie was always big we'd always sit down pre-season and write pros of cons of us being in that division what are we up against what's going for us and I think after we did start so poorly, um, teams were probably taking us for granted a little bit, but under the radar, we was slowly, slowly getting it going again, adding to the squad. Um, yeah, and finished with real momentum that season that obviously spilled over into the next one. You said your memory was a bit hazy, but QPR, you actually scored in that game. So you remember that game? Remember it nil, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, listen, things like that helped to remember stuff, didn't it? But that was the game. I remember coming in, we was quite near the end of the season. I think QPR were fighting for the top two. I think Gaz O'Neill might have even been playing for QPR that day. Um, but I remember coming off thinking, we've battered these and these are going to go up this year. Um, and yeah, I always thought that was a, a real catalyst for for gaining some momentum going into the end of the season and taking it into the next one. Ten men at the end. Ten men, yeah. Yeah, you'll have to remind me you got sent off, Neil. Harry Arter. Did he? There's a shock. <laughs> <laughs> now, the following season, the promotion season, we could write a book about that. If you wrote a book, what would you title it? <sighs> misfits, I suppose, Neil, yeah. We, we was. We was, we was a bunch <laughs> of misfits that just fell into place and genius of a manager that, that sprinkled his his sort of yeah his his way and his philosophy on us and yeah it was just yeah you, we we could write a book 10 times over and never got bored of it when did you think that promotion dream could become a reality in that season i think going back to that qpr game the season before um, we made some really shrewd signings we we lost lewis graben that season which was a big hit um to norwich but replaced him obviously with wills i think gozo come in that summer and so did junior and i always say it's like probably well documented there probably has been books that have quoted me saying I remember going for a coffee one afternoon with Gozo and Gozo had been at some big clubs and played with some top players most of his career in the Premier League at that stage and and just asking him what he thought because I'd never been at this level I'd never been uh, I'd never had promotion from the Championship to the Prem and, and he's someone who had played in the Prem and I just sort of asked him what he thought of the squad and he said like he was just blown away by the training the intensity that we, that we trained with the quality of training the sessions that that we were doing. Um, Jesus, a pigeon's just flown into the window there, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think just seen right. the feathers. Yeah. <laughs> Late transfer <laughs> signing there, yeah. <laughs> Trying to get in. Um, so yeah, I remember sitting with Gozo and yeah, when he said that to me, it just gave me a little bit of, um, I suppose, inspiration and nothing to fear going into the, to the next season. And if someone like him was saying that, um, then we would have a good chance of, of doing well that season. Tell us a little bit about the build-up to that Bolton game, because obviously our game was on the Monday. On the Saturday, it was Fulham v Middlesbrough. I understand you went to the Limewood Hotel and turned your phone off. Yeah, we, we trained that morning, and obviously when, when things are, are getting close like that and you're looking at the, the league table every two minutes, you're refreshing your phone and you're keeping an eye on all sorts of scores. But we trained that morning. Uh, obviously, everyone else was playing and we wasn't. Um, and Eddie just said, yeah, listen, just try and get away from it for the afternoon press her everywhere Neil as you would have known and yeah all over you and trying to create stories and it start of it sort of starts to become yeah this is written in the stars like this is going to happen but you need to remain focused and Eddie said just try and get away from the afternoon night I ended up going to I think it was it was either the Limewood or might have been something else the, the pig or something in in the forest and yeah I, I knew I'd have no signal on my phone and yeah just got away with the missus for the afternoon and, and tried to switch off from it all and then switch your phone on after or you get a bit of signal and you see all these messages flying through and yeah it, it, it was it was time it was time Is that the longest Sunday ever just waiting for the game yeah like it wasn't it wasn't because I was just so confident of what we had and what we was you know getting going I thought we was just peaking at the right time and 
with all due respect to Bolton at the time, but we had faced bigger challenges in the season and we were so well rehearsed and drilled. Um, I was just so, so confident. I remember the training session was a million miles an hour the morning before, the morning, yeah, the morning before. Um, and it was just, <laughs> I remember doing a press conference in, in the lounge and someone asked me, do you feel the pressure? And I said, uh, nah, that, that pressure's when you're out injured and you don't know whether you're going to play again and you've got a mortgage to pay and you've got a career and you've got to try and make a living out of this game. That's pressure. Like, this is an absolute privilege and we've got to bottle this up and absolutely revel in it. If anyone in here had expected us to be where we are now, like, th there was no chance. So it was just something that we embraced as a group and, again, it was there was inspiration to be drawn from it and Eddie being Eddie, there was advantages. Of course, there was disadvantages, but we all geared that up towards being advantages and, and, and yeah, the rest took care of itself, didn't it? Before the Bolton game on that Saturday when you were lunching at the Pig, there was a huge game going on elsewhere, Fulham v Middlesbrough. I think Scott Parker yeah. was playing and I know Harry was among, Harry Arter was among the... Yeah, Harry being, the... Harry being Harry, yeah. It, it was, Eddie was telling us to get, get away from it all and, and Harry being Harry had to go and watch, didn't he? So he went and watched and was keeping us updated with the score and yeah, listen, different people deal with things in these moments in different ways and, and that was just Harry. If Harry wasn't playing on a Saturday and, and, and his brother-in-law was, he would have gone and watched him. So that was normal for Harry. So yeah, it was brilliant. For people who don't remember... Just tell us what happened in that Fulham Middlesbrough game. Was I think the goalkeeper yeah, went goalkeeper up, got it? sent up. Ridiculous decision from Karanka, wasn't it? I think they was they needed a draw and they would have still given themselves a chance, uh, an unlikely one to get promoted. But they was drawing and they sent the goalkeeper and everyone up for a corner. It was three three, and an old teammate of mine that I went on to play over at Villa, Ross McCormack, stayed up from the corner. Um, Fulham cleared the corner Ross went on and scored an open goal and that essentially wrote their chances off so yeah it was, when you say it was written in the stars it was like decisions being made like that in high pressure situations were just going for us but I never felt like that cauldron of pressure ever affected us it was just business and and this is us and yeah let's, let's go and do it Promotion secured. You have that open do top bus parade. By the looks of the photos, it was probably a good job none of you were driving. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been amazing for you. I mean, yeah. Bournemouth Seafront was absolutely packed, packed. And, and the fans came out in their numbers. And listen, we are little old Bournemouth and, and plucky Bournemouth or whatever, but when you do something like that and you see the amount of support that we had in the town and to go and lay that legacy down, maybe we're not such a little old Bournemouth, you know, and there is scope for this club to get all them fans in, in, in a stadium one day. So, yeah, just great to see, to have that power to be able to bring that amount of people together and celebrate something together is, yeah, is, is something that's... People go throughout their career not winning anything, play at the top level but don't win anything. I've been lucky enough to do it four times, like really, really lucky uh, through hard work and, and good managers and good teammates. And those moments are just, they're, they're priceless. Did it surprise you how many people turned up? Yeah, it did because... Two years before, we, we went on the League One parade and I remember turning open top bus, the driver took the wrong turn and we were sort of going up the Wessex way, so <laughs> a bit windswept. But then we managed to get back on, on track and and turned into the, the town centre or whatever. And it was busy, like it was good. But I remember we had an open top plan, uh, open top bus planned and it was oh, really like, is it really that? Well, can't we just get them to the stadium or celebrate here? But then when we turned around the corner to see the amount of people, that yeah, it was, yeah blown away you get to the Premier League I want to ask you about that disallowed goal against Liverpool it would have been your first Premier League goal and it was a, a rule change that deprived you of that rule change yeah and we actually had uh, I think the head of the referees association that year was Craig Porson maybe and he come and done a talk with us about how they was changing the offside rule and if someone was standing offside when the ball was kicked they can't then come back on their sort of that. anyway ended up scoring and they disallowed my goal for a foul on I think it was Lovren at the time and then Monday night football away at Anfield nil nil five or ten minutes to go and they get a free kick whip it in and Benteke scores and he's like clearly ten yards five yards offside um, if there was VAR about then it would have definitely been disallowed but yeah it was tough tough pill to swallow that one 12 games in the Premier League that, that season did, did you sort of sense that the writing might have been on the wall for you because you didn't feature as much as you may have hoped um, no, it was mainly the, like I played the first six and the last seven, um, something like that. And 
the chunk I missed was mainly down to, to injury, really, Neil. And, and I remember playing at Leicester at home, especially, and West Ham away. And I thought, do you know what? I'm actually comfortable at this level. Like, I feel good about myself. I've got a spring in my step. I've got a great rhythm. Um, and I remember the West Ham game. It was at the old Upton Park. And I remember clearing the ball last five minutes. Someone just caught me on the edge of my ankle. Um, we had an international break, so we had a couple of weeks without a game. Um, but my ankle just kept blowing up and played Norwich, I think, after that. And in the warm up, I was snookered. Like, I was like, oh, I'm in trouble here. Um, madly taping everything up and sort of anti inflams and, and whatnot. And got through the first half, but I was struggling. And then by the end of it, I just couldn't walk. Um, so I get it was opera, another operation for me at that point. Um, and yeah, I had, I had a long time. We, it took a long time for us to find out what the problem was. I remember flying to Sweden to see uh, a tendon specialist who I'd seen previously about me Achilles. I didn't know if it was linked to that. And it wasn't until sort of six to eight weeks down the line, we actually found out what it was. It required surgery, um, sort of got back in the new year, had a bit between my teeth again, but uh, the lads have been through so much results at sort of Man United at home, Chelsea away, they're, they're gone and performed so, so well in the Premier League. And when the lads are going and doing this stuff, they're creating something and you can't help but feel you're on the outside of that, even though you're captain and you still, you might be traveling or you might be in the dress room every day or in the dress room for game days. It's, for me, it's like all or nothing, do you know what I mean? And I'm taking myself away to try and get this ankle right. And I can see lads sort of getting better and better. And this one signing a new contract, that one signing a new contract. Geez, I'm getting left behind here. I'm panicking a little bit. I'm trying to get back sooner than what I should be. Probably come back a little bit too soon. I remember playing a game in the FA Cup against Pompey and didn't feel right. Um, finally got back, played the last six and, and was part of the team that I suppose secured our Premier League status. So I didn't feel at the time the writing was on the wall, but things were happening without me. And like I said before, I'm not one to out welcome my stay. When the time's right, the time's right. And I always wanted to pay, play for a big football club. I remember sitting down with Ed at, at the end of the season. Club were great with me, offered me a new deal, but said Ed said, you got a you got a real challenge on your hands to get back in the team. Frano had stepped in from right back to centre half and done brilliantly. Um, I was going to be one of four. Um, it's up to you, sort of thing. There's a new contract. Sit on it. Think about it. Um, and in the meantime, I had a phone call, probably last international break, uh, from someone at Villa saying oh, they had knew they that we actually relegated them that that one weekend and I had a phone call later, sort of couple of weeks later saying look we're gonna have a right guy in the championship next year do you fancy it and it was a level I knew I was comfortable at it was a level that I knew I could win that league um and it was a massive massive football club I remember playing there that day and I played there before I'm thinking geez this is proper and I always wanted to experience that pressure of playing for a big football club and I suppose it was just yeah it was one of them Neil I had the chance to go and captain Aston Villa or stay at Bournemouth and fight for my place um, did I feel there was a real real need for me at, at Bournemouth anymore it was debatable I always would have backed myself to come back and, and, and win my spot back but as I say when things have moved on and they've experienced all this without you there's just something nagging away in the back of your head thinking this could be the right time and it was the right time um, because it brings us back to where I am now. Sometimes you can sort of stay a little bit longer than you should do and it doesn't end quite how you want it to end. And yeah, that, but I felt like I, I left. We'd been on the most unbelievable journey. It couldn't get no better. I had a chance to go and secure my future for a little bit longer at, at Aston Villa, a club that, you know, I thought it would be easy. I thought I'd go and recreate what we created at Bournemouth and go and win that league and I'd be in the Premier League with Aston Villa you know what I mean? And that's that's the end of it sort of thing. But yeah, you know, you, you go and you go away and you learn these things and sometimes the grass isn't always greener. But I stand by it brings me back to this position now and there are the times when you really, really learn. They are they they I had some real tough times at Villa and that is where all my lessons were learnt. Talking about Villa, that day that we secured our Premier League status in the first season, one of my memories of that was a terribly toxic atmosphere with the home fans really on their players' backs. What possessed you to want to want to go there? <sighs> Probably that, Neil. <laughs> Just to, to be able to get that. I, I'd played there when I was at Brighton in the third round of the FA Cup and I'd scored. 
And uh, I remember coming away and like I scored in front of the whole end, and I just thought I'd what the era I grew up in. I'd watched FA Cup semi-finals at Aston at, at Villa Park, and it was this rich, like esteemed in such rich history club, and it still had that real old school classiness about it. And I remember going back there and that day playing there and looking around and thinking, oh, this is this is proper." And they read the teams out and they booed one to eleven bar one lad who was a local homegrown lad and yeah it was absolutely toxic but you was looking around thinking how has this club got into this mess like you they were a top six Premier League club for so long under Martin O'Neill and, and before that Ron Atkinson and managers like this and they had some such wonderful players and it was just like this is a real shame and what I'd been sold to go and turn that round as we did in the finish it took three years longer than I thought it would take but as we did in the finish that club so powerful. I have to say it was probably one of the most moving interviews I've ever conducted, certainly on the phone, was with you when it was announced that you would be leaving and, and going to Villa. Do you, do you, I know you were upset. Yeah, no, I was, yeah, we had to, I think we had to cut it about three times, Neil, I had to keep, I remember going back to my mum and dad's and I was having to take myself off for a walk up the garden and ringing your back, so right, I'm ready, Neil, let's get this done quick, hurry up. Um, but yeah, it was just, we'd been through so much together and I remember driving back from Villa to Brighton, from Birmingham to Brighton, sorry, after signing and speaking to Ed for, for, for ages on the phone, like real emotional stuff because that's what made us such a unique group and such a unique story was the, the passion and uh, the feelings were genuine. They were and there's lads in that dressing room like I'd, I'd do anything for to this lad, you know talk about Harry the, the the troubles that he went through over that period um lads like Frano when he's had to take a setback like he has to come again Charlie um Cookie you know Sirs you just go through that team Matty Ritchie Callum grabs before that you know Josh McCoy's Brett Pittman's um and the feeling we had and the genuine emotions and whatnot of what made us special and what brought us success, um, that was tougher than leaving Brighton. Like, genuinely was. I remember coming to collect my stuff and, and yeah, just all sorts of emotions and, and thoughts running through your head, like, should you be doing it? Is it right? And and, and whatnot. Um, but, yeah, I, I wouldn't change that decision again because like when you see when you come back to the club and you're still held in that regard and you still have the relationships you do with the likes of Neil Vacher yourselves Neil Blake Richard Hughes Frano uh, Paul the chef SA the chef Marta working in the kitchens because I wasn't tired because I wasn't going through that that when players come to the end you know it's either a player outgrows a club or a club outgrows a player there's no easy way about it and it was like yeah I've give everything to this for four years it doesn't get better than this, you know, I, it doesn't. So let's, let's, let's get on and do something else and try and create another bit of history somewhere else. Am I right in thinking that when you left, you went around all the offices to say goodbye to everyone? Yeah, like even the chairman, Jeff, like, yeah, just, yeah, it's something. We've been through so much and like I say, good people is so powerful and it, when you're being led by someone who's so clear in want, what he wants to do, the others come with it and that was part of, if you like, captain's role or whatever is when I come here this was the training ground the stadium was the training ground so you would get to know everyone on a personal level but that was part of what I I always felt people should feel special and feel like they had significance doing what they do to play a part to get the club where we want to go get into the Premier League Jesus Christ when I first signed for this club like did, did we ever think about that absolutely not but then once you start getting a taste for it and a and a, and a smell for it and, and that's the driving force yeah and, and I owe it to them people because they they played just as much a part in in me you know what I mean propping us all up supporting us soft tissue guys whether it's someone doing the tickets Alice to see Alice doing what she's doing now with Neil Vay it's brilliant Alice started on the reception do you know what I mean but it's all good people working towards one goal and improving yourselves and, and let's see where it takes us three years at Villa what was that like? Tough, uh, um, unbelievable, uh, disappointing, anger. I had every emotion, um, but I wouldn't change it for the world because it's it's created who I am now. And I talked to Frano about this now. When you only see one style and one club for so long and you end on that note, that's all you know. But when I had seen Gus, I'd seen Eddie, I'd seen my youth team managers, good coaches, and in between that, 
you get the one that's not quite what you thought he's going to be or doesn't do this or doesn't do that and then you go somewhere else and well why ain't she on the reception trying to help me like Alice was or why is the chef not like how Paul was or Jesus Christ well the manager should be doing set pieces on a Friday or naming the team like where's this all and it's not until you experience those bad times you appreciate the good times and learn from what you was doing right so I had to do that and I had to experience that to mould and shape who and what I want to become. Am I right in thinking that John Terry was one of your idols when you were a kid and you got the chance to work with him? Yeah, and, and, and looking back at that, Neil, like I've, I've worked with John Terry, one of the most decorated, if not the most decorated English player. Uh, Jack Grealish, just gone for 100 million. Um, so many, Glenn Whelan, 80 odd caps for Ireland, Chesey, the, the, Mile Jedinak, three World Cups. What I saw and experienced at Villa was mental good and bad um, big club brings different pressures and, and different pitfalls and you have to go and experience that to know what you could be dealt with further down the line and it was troubled it was really troubled it was there was poison in the brickworks to start off with um, Steve Bruce done the most unbelievable job at weeding that out and bringing it all together and he used to say getting the ship steering the ship round and wasn't a manager that I particularly took a shine to in the way he coached or managed but taught me a lot about how to bring people together and create a group and and see a different style, a style that's been hugely successful over the years. Um, so as I say, to I've experienced Roberto Di Matteo, uh, Champions League winning manager, <laughs> Steve Bruce, one of the most successful managers in the championship, if you like, in, in sort of modern times. Dean Smith, bit of a um, trailblazer, like, done stuff and I thought wow that's powerful like that's that's really good I like that um, even going out on loan moving to different parts of the countries went up to Hull went down to Reading learning how these different clubs uh, are motivated differently uh, feeling what it's like for a player to pack a bag and go the next day and not have any notice and almost try and save your career and managers like Nigel Atkins one of the most underrated managers I've ever worked for what he did for me in a period where I was really really low to build me up and, and 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 give me confidence again to go back to Villa and, and ultimately do the job that, that was in hand. It took us, as I said, longer than I thought. But um, yes, it's, it's shaped me for, for who I am now. But going back to your question, it was about John Terry, wasn't it? <laughs> Seeing someone train like that every day was, yeah, again, the professionalism he brought and the standards that he brought to the training ground was, was superb. You end up at Huddersfield, 14 games in, against Preston at Deepdale, you tear your ACL what were your memories of that how did that all, all happen did you know straight yeah, away you no know, uh, it was a nightmare from start to finish I'll be honest um, and, and not a period that uh, it was tough really really tough um, so when I went back to Villa for the six months on loan uh, another injury uh, we we just started to, to really get it going again at, at, at Villa Jack Grealish returned from injury. I remember playing against Derby. We won 4-0 and with about five or 10 minutes, Tyrone who had come on loan, knew I was playing with, passed me a, a square ball, sent me a little bit short. I've gone to take off to, to, to go and get it and felt a pop in the bottom of my foot. And it was the side that I'd done my Achilles on. So I was like panicking now again. Um, ended up having quite a bad tear in the bottom of my foot and, and missed the end of the season. Um, we got to the playoffs that year. Um, I was still out injured. And I had a phone call from uh, the manager at the time was Jan Siva, Huddersfield just getting relegated from from the, the Premier League. Um, I'd learnt so much from going to a relegated club in Aston Villa and I did certain things that I would change. Um, and I thought I could use them experiences to try and get that on the path that it needed to be to, to have a competitive season the dream that was sold to me that certain players were staying and this was going to be the team and this is how it's going to look and the manager presented quite well and I thought yeah I had had success at Hull which was in Yorkshire going up to there sort of had a, some sort of connection with what it's like to live in Yorkshire and felt comfortable going there but unfortunately yeah it just, just didn't turn out the way I wanted it to was it nine operations you ended up having in the end? Nine I've ended up having, yeah. So just just too many and I've, I've got to a stage now where I'm just fed up of sitting on a, a physio bed Um and it, it's not it's not just what it does to your body but mentally you know to, to keep coming back from them and for me my career has been um, 
not dictated to, but it's almost fell into place through injuries. If I'd never done my Achilles at Brighton, I probably wouldn't have ended up at Bournemouth. If I didn't get injured in the first Premier League season, I would have moved to Villa that summer. If I didn't get injured at, at Villa, I might have stayed at Villa and never gone to Huddersfield. If I didn't have such a bad injury at Huddersfield, I probably wouldn't be sitting here now. I'd still be playing probably. So these things, I'm a big believer in things happen for a reason. Um, and while I was out injured, went searching for, for what the next phase of, of, of my career might look like. And, and yeah, we're, we're here now. It must have been such a, a tough time for you, as you say, being out injured. Did that give you time to think? Did that give you time to explore your options, be it in coaching, be it in punditry, be it? Yeah, be it like I'd, I'd, I'd done quite a bit of the punditry the year we was in the Premier League and I was out injured. Um, but it's just something that's not really turned me on. It's not really it's like you get up, there's a pack in front of you. These are all the details, these are all the stats. Yeah, just read that off. Like, I'm someone who has an opinion, I'm someone who. As I say, I think I know and f how and it should feel and what it should smell like success. And I'm a massive believer in people and, and good people and bringing people together. Um, and that's the one thing that I've definitely been taught over over my career. You know, you need good people. You need to be surrounded by good people. And yeah, it's, it's very powerful. Um, and as I say, I had a lot of time out injured, uh, sounded out a lot of people um, in the game as to, to what could be the next sort of thing for me. I, I took a lot of time to go and watch games with different people. I went and watched it with managers. I went and watched games with technical directors. I went and watched it with lads who were clipping games for an opposition the next game. I went and watched games with my agent, uh, with my family. Um, and then you start forming an opinion and, and, and sort of what you're about. And it just felt right. As I say, again, Neil, Neil touched on it. I've, I've got two kids now. Like they, they were the most unbelievable thing for me, the, the two girls and, and my missus. Um, without that support network around you, you know, it can get tough. Um, but I was really lucky to, to come home to them every day. Um, and they supported me the whole way through that. Even now when you're talking about moving down and you need the support of your family and you need your missus to be prepared to pack the house up and go somewhere where we're really comfortable living and really happy and set a new life up again. It's, it's, it's nice to come back where we're somewhere where we're familiar with and somewhere where you you think you've got some sort of stock. So, yeah, as I said, I had a lot of time to think about it and explore different things, and I, I feel this is the right route for me. Has your missus forgiven you for what happened on the honeymoon, and can you tell us what happened <laughs> no, again? Yeah, so it was the summer I left here to go to Villa. Chatted to Ed. Um, we had the game at Manchester at United, didn't we? The bomb scare game, where we thought there was a bomb, and... The game got put off until the week after, weird set of circumstances. And because that everything sort of get, got delayed and I was getting married that summer. Um, so we played on the Tuesday, come and met Ed on the Wednesday. I was flying out to Mistagdu with the lads on the Thursday, stayed there. And while I was away, I sort of started to sense that the Villa thing could be real. Um, come back, I think I had a few days before I got married and remember being at the wedding with my missus and said, oh, Spoke to my agent last night, first dance. <laughs> Mrs. looked at me, said, oh, don't, don't, don't do this to me. I said, yeah, could be going to Villa, darling. <laughs> what? <laughs> Looking around at all our friends. Um, so we fly out a few days later for, for our honeymoon. And yeah, things just sped up really, really quickly. And, and before you know it, you're on a flight back to do a medical at Villa. And who replaced you on that? Mother-in-law, yeah, she was buzzing in the honeymoon suite. I think we was, we was in Capri at the time, so she flew out. Um, so yeah, oh, we we went back and did it the next year. But it's even stuff like that, Neil. Like I would never ever ask a player going forward if I ever get in that like opportunity or chance to. I would never ask a player to give those sort of things up for something like that because at the end of the day, your family are the most important thing. And you know, talking about being impulsive and and yeah, I've got a sense for it. I'm off. Like when I left Brighton or whether I left Bournemouth and. It's like, yeah, I've got to go, darling. Yeah, sorry, I've got a flight booked. They've booked me a flight back. Your mum's flying out, don't worry. And it's like, nah, do you know what? I wish I'd stayed out with my missus and enjoyed it and made them wait for me. And that's probably the one thing I would have changed about Villa. I probably would have gone in a little bit later because there was so much upheaval and so much going on at the club. New ownership, new manager, players coming and going. And if that had settled a little bit before I'd got there, it'd have been an easier proposition to go into. I think we're we're seeing that with Eddie Howe seems to be in no rush to get back in and he's obviously enjoying quality time with with his family so that resonates yeah, rightly so too because it's it's when you're in these things and I've had a long time to prepare for moving down to here and 
you need that adjustment period and you need to clear your mind and you need to reset and if it's not right you know what there's there's a reason it's not right and yeah with the times that I did move in my career probably jumped at it a little bit too quickly and I wish I'd just stepped back a little bit and as I say you know that all these things shape you and going forward when there are decisions hopefully down the line for me to make it's sort of well chill step back weigh it all up make the right decision just tell us about that retirement decision what's sort of going through your mind is it something instant something you think about for a long time and what have you was it doctor's advice or your decision or what uh, definitely not doctor's advice because i'll be on a big insurance payout now <laughs> so it's not that um no it was as i say I, I went to huddersfield um was just getting going we changed the managers felt like, felt like i was really just getting going and finding a bit of rhythm we had a tough start uh pressing away uh, yeah, went for a bouncing ball, lad, ridiculous challenge, studs up, went into the tackle, didn't know, to answer your question earlier, didn't know what I'd done. We was actually flying out on a training camp, it was an international break, probably this time actually, or the next international break maybe. We was flying out for a warm weather training camp and um, I had to stay behind for a scan and I, I thought I might have just opened up my MCL or something, no major swelling. Had the scan, surgeon said to me, yeah, you've, you've popped your MCL. So I thought, no, it's not too bad. Three or four months needed an operation. He said, I'm not quite sure about your ACL. I need to have a look at that. So when he opened me up, come round from the operation, he said, yeah, it looks like a firework's gone off in your knee. <laughs> so I thought, oh, this don't sound too good. So I'd done my ACL, uh, done my MCL. Um, so it was a bit of a shock. But I'm one of them, once I've got something in front of me, I'll deal with it pretty quickly and, and get my head round it and, and go to war with it. So I was happy enough with, with how the rehab went. I had a great physio, great medical team. Got back from the ACL and the MCL. First day of pre-season, my other side locked up on me. And I remember thinking to myself after that operation, that was my eighth operation, I remember thinking to myself, if I need another one, like I haven't got the patience for it, I haven't got the energy for it. If I need another one, I'm, I'm done. Um, yeah, so come back that pre the next pre-season, left side had locked up on me, went down to see the surgeon, I'll give it, this is what we'll do, we'll have a couple of injections, give it this time, and if it hasn't improved, might need to open you up and have a look. And yeah, I had sort of underlying cartilage issues, um, which listen, we, we, we've cleared up and, and knees are fine now, but just sort of got back, I had, I had a long time out, long time to think about it wasn't definitely wasn't an impulsive decision as I say I, I'd always remained in contact with the likes of Husey and Frano and and certain people at the club um had spent time with them um had been out to watch games and I think the big thing for me now is I, I didn't want to be that old declining player who was dropping down the leagues and oh that's Tommy Alfick used to captain Bournemouth Jesus what's happened to him or or stuff like that so I'd rather be it's a young man's game and I'd rather be a young aspiring coach than, than an old declining player it just it, it basically come down to that and I feel like I can give certain things back to the game I feel like I have a have a have a place in the game going forward long term um, so yeah just just excited and, and ready to get stuck into that rather than trying to get stuck into a pre-season and, and keep the knees sound you you announced your retirement on BBC Radio Solent ahead of our game against Birmingham you gave Chris Temple, the first exclusive of his career, which was he obviously thanked you for. Just tell us what you made of the response afterwards. Yeah, it's something I didn't really play. Like in my head, I was retired. Like I've I've been retired for six months now, and that do you know what? That's probably unfair to say to Huddersfield. Um, but I, yeah, I feel like I've been retired since that second operation I needed at, at Huddersfield. Um, I just yeah, I couldn't. I was just in the gym every day on a physio bed, and I was just yeah, I'm, I'm done. Like I'm. I, yeah just not up for this fight anymore like it's been one too many and my body's tired but my mind's fresh I still had a massive input in the dressing room still felt like people listened to me um, and it just felt right as I said the girls getting to the age they're getting to now it's it's quite nice to come back down south and, and hopefully set up camp with them soon um, and then you come to that point where I didn't really want to make a big thing about it do you know what I mean it was it's not who I am it's not what I'm about and you get asked the question yeah I'm, I'm retired and then to be fair the response you get is is yeah it's overwhelming and it's, it's, it's a strange one Neil because there's certain people you think you're going to hear from that you don't hear from but it's the ones that you don't think you're going to hear from that you hear from and you're like wow like he actually went out of his he's, he's taken something from me and he's learnt from me and he's appreciated me as a teammate 
that means more to me than anything. And it, that's when I left Bournemouth, like those messages and those well wishes, that's success. I remember saying it. And again, getting to this stage in my career, is it a year or two early? Possibly, but I don't need to go and prove anything. I've, I've won League One twice. I've, I've, I've won the championship twice. That's the level I'm at. I'm not going to go and win the Premier League or the FA Cup or the League Cup. So I don't need to drop down and win League Two. Like, what's the point? So I'm just really happy, really content. It's quite nice to say I'm retired because it sort of it was the last weight lifted off my shoulders. Um, and, and now, obviously, to, to, to be able to tell everyone what, what the path is for me and, and, and where I am and, and, and give something back to a, a club that they, they rescued me when I thought I was down and out. Tommy, it's been brilliant to hear all about your career. Now, before we let you go, we have got a few questions that have been submitted by fans, which is just going to rattle through quite quickly. So the first one has come from Rob Matley on Twitter. He says, in an illustrious AFCB career, do you have any regrets or disappointments? No, um, it's, it's, it's very hard to, to have any regrets or, or disappointments. As I say, I could probably look back at the time I left and think maybe I should have stayed and, and whatnot, but... I honestly believe that that's led me sort of back to here and now to this day. So, absolutely not. It was it was nothing but just just pure joy and and just really lucky to be part of a special group. Now the AFCB fan page want to know how did your pre-match ritual start? And for those who don't know, tell us a little bit more about it. <laughs> just please, I don't have to do it anymore. Um, yeah, and no, I just started off. I remember the first game I played for Brighton. The goalkeeper needed to change his, his top because he had the wrong colour top on, and the dressing room was was miles away. And I went over to the post and, and banged my boots off against the post to get the mud off him, and just stuck with me from there really. And and met a psychologist further down f further down the line and he noticed what I was doing um, and just said I think that's quite a good time to go through some sort of pre-match ritual to get you in the headspace that you need to get into because I always because I played on my emotions and, and I was quite passionate I could sometimes get a bit too revved and play on the metal a bit too much and that could lead to mistakes or making wrong decisions so it was quite an actual time nice time for me to get over there chill out have a connection with the fans get in the headspace that I needed to be in. So yeah, just developed from the first game really. So AFC Bournemouth Germany is asking what memory do you cherish most from your playing career, be it at Bournemouth or elsewhere? Yeah, listen, it's it's very hard to be look beyond what we did the season we got to the, to the Premier League. Uh, it, it has left a legacy behind. It's it's written down and for me, I'll, I'll, I'd go to town with anyone. I've, I've said it previously. I think it's one of the best ever teams to get out of the championship. I stand by that. The way we was drilled, the players that we had, the characters that we had, the division that we was in that year. It was such a tough division, some real big hitters, some big money being spent about. Um, coming back from my injury, I, th I think the thing I'm proudest of the most is coming back from the injuries, coming back from them setbacks, because they was all serious injuries. I never had a hamstring that I had to just sort of, it was three weeks and it, it sort of naturally heal itself. It was all operations and big setbacks. So to be able to come back from them, I think I played 400 games and, and I won four promotions. So to get a promotion every 100 games, it's, you know what I mean? It's actually quite, quite, quite a nice thing to say. And the last one comes from Johnny Bullet. He's saying, you're going to help out in the academy to start with. What piece of advice would you wish that you had been given at their age? Like I was very lucky to, to be surrounded by a really good family and uh, really good advisors, friends. Um, so I, I hold no regrets. I always give myself the best chance to, to make a career and a, and a living at the game. Um, and I suppose it's just that, just give yourself the best possible chance, stuff that don't cost nothing, manners, respect, um, being on time, working hard, just maximise everything that you've got. I feel like I did that throughout my career. Um, as I say, when you have had success, when you've won stuff in a group, it means so much more. And you know, to get them little groups going now, to, to understand what winning means and where it can take you, yes, it's, it's so powerful. Just had one, one more question come through from a big fan on my phone. This is from a Mrs. K. Perrot. She's asking whether you one day would fancy the manager's job. It's one of them, Neil. Like, we can all sit in dressing rooms and you, you sort of, you have these conversations when you get to the latter stages of your life. Oh, what do you want to do? Oh, you're a coach, you're management. Yeah, you've got the personality to do this. And oh, I want to be an agent. Oh, I want to do TV work. Or 
I'm going to swan off into the sunset and, and never watch a football match again. And until you've actually gone and lived it, you don't know. I, I, I sit here now, yeah, of course I want to coach. Of course, I'm lucky enough to be coaching. Of course I want to manage. But until you've actually gone and coached and gone and done the yards and, and gone and done what's required to be done, you can't sit here and say you want to be a manager until you've, you understand what it takes. And you, you see our manager now and you see the likes of Eddie and the successful ones. They was in even before you thought about getting up and, and still in even before you, you know what I mean? When you was having your dinner, they were still in. So until you've actually gone and done that, I think I want to do it. I think I know what it should feel and smell and, and look like. And, and I think I know how to work backwards from trying to win a promotion or trying to win a game. But you, you need to go and do it now. And I've been sitting in the dressing room for a long time, as I said, with an opinion and oh, why is he doing this? Second guessing that, questioning that. It's, it's a whole new new world when you're the one who's being looked at by 20 other lads and you're the one there delivering sessions so let's see well Tommy it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the official AFC Bournemouth podcast we hope you've enjoyed it too and we're certainly looking forward to seeing you around Vitality Stadium a little bit more brilliant. now brilliant thank you now then if you've enjoyed listening to our podcast we would absolutely love it if you could like and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to We'd also be very grateful for any shares on social media so that other fans, be it AFC Bournemouth related or the general football fan, can enjoy it too. Our thanks again to Tommy Elphick and from Neil Perrett and myself, Zoe Rundle. Thank you for tuning in to the official AFC Bournemouth podcast.